Welcome to the Perspectives with Catherine Toon podcast. All right. Well, everybody, I am so happy as always to have Brad Jerzak back on the program. It's always, it's wonderful to see you, Brad. I love you. Thank you. Love to you as well. So I love the background that Brad has, and I wore the corresponding shirt. So we coordinated without trying. That must have been a Jesus thing. So anyway, um, we're going to talk about hot button for me. It's all about love. And I, I felt like that was a Holy Spirit driven topic when we were discussing what, what we were going to talk about. Uh, so you know, and actually part of this was because I was actually listening to a recording that you made about a similar topic. It wasn't the same uh, title, uh, but it's what it's the person of love who drives everything in love. And, uh, you know, we were also talking about some just life challenges uh, that happen bumps along the way and how, you know, we can sort of rest in the midst of perceived crisis because we're uh, held by the one who is love, who adores us, and has this incredible ability to work out all the details, which is great. So anyway, so, um, you know, how did you want to uh, uh, start out with this? How how do you perceive um, kind of everything about love? It's all about love. God is the person of love, how to connect with love. Feel free to just dive in. Yeah, to begin with, I think this is, it, it has been a a little bit of a trite saying where we took the beautiful phrase from 1 John that God is love. Mm -hmm. And I suppose we became so familiar with it mm -hmm. that we stopped seeing the depths of it and we started adding a lot of conditions to it. Mm. and and god is sort of love <laughs> or he's he's love but he's got some dirty little secrets mm -hmm. uh, behind his back he's love but he also and so this has been a real theme for me that when we talk about god is love it's god is love but nothing mm -hmm. when john says god is love his next word is not but <laughs> and he doesn't add caveats in mm -hmm. fact from there he goes on to say that because god is is perfect love mm -hmm. um that that perfect love drives out fear and maybe we could think about that that the opposite of love isn't actually hatred it's it's mm -hmm. fear and especially john says uh the one who's not yet been perfected in love they they experience especially this idea of fear of punishment is yes. central then to their doctrine Mm -hmm. So they begin to think, okay, God is love, but he's also the punisher. Um, he's He wants to punish you. Well, he doesn't really want to, but he kind of has to. And, and then in order to forgive you, he couldn't really just forgive you. He had to punish his son. And, and of course, if you receive that, you get eternal life. But if you don't, he has to punish you forever. And so this, and, and first John, it's just this incredibly mature theology of John the Beloved. That's his nickname, John the Beloved. He's come to understand that any condition you put on the love of God mm -hmm. is your God. I learned this from C.E.W. Yes. Green the other day, because that means that God is subject to something other than love that limits his love. Mm -hmm. And um, and and uh, I think we have a really great ally in, in the Apostle Paul here, where he said that the love of God is higher, wider, longer and deeper than you can ever conceive ever grasp ever imagine so go ahead go nuts <laughs> imagine it as wide as you can it'll be wider go as deep as yeah. you can it'll be deeper go as far as you can it'll be further as high as you can you're not going to reach the top the bottom the, you know you can't fall off the edge of the table of god's love mm. and um so that's my starting point and it and it's really interesting that when i go there um there are those who really resist it, uh, Christians, because yeah. that's not their concept of God, mm -hmm. or they're able to fit God into a kind of love box that is smaller and 
you know, as I said, conditional. So that's where I would start with this is who is God? God is infinite, unfailing love. Mm -hmm. And this infinite spring is, uh, some would say, eternal, infinite relationality. Mm. He relates and he responds. And this is who God is and who God is seen to be in the person of Jesus. I mean, that's so amazing because there's never a time where where what humanity ultimately really needs boils down to something other than love. Love contains everything else. Love is as big as God. Yeah. And and I love that when you we're talking about, you know, putting putting love in a box means constraining God. And we already talked about the table with no edges that yeah. you can't fall off the table of his love banquet or himself as the person of love who's undergirding everything. And, you know, I, I get accused a lot, of, you know, well, you know, talk about judgment, talk about this and that. And I'm like, yeah, that's all a facet of God's love. And I'll stop talking about love when we get it. But I don't think we're going to be, uh, you know, nailing it anytime soon because it's as big as God. Yeah, yeah. And I really facets. think you nailed it by calling these other attributes mm -hmm. facets. Mm -hmm. Any attribute of God that is not a facet of love is not an attribute of God. It's mm -hmm. so what we what we ad attribute just means what I attribute to him. Mm -hmm. Why do I attribute to these things him these things? Well, I, I mean, I may see them in scripture. I may see them in my experience. And so we'll make this list of the attributes of God. But they, if they're not an adjective of love, we're out of bounds already. Mm -hmm. And so it is, let's say, holiness, righteousness and justice. Mm -hmm. Well, the holiness and righteousness and justice of God are facets of his love. The holiness and righteousness and and justice that are not adjectives of love, that are as over against love, mm -hmm. that's what crucified Jesus. Yes. So I think oh. we have no business in those arenas if, if, if they're somewhere other than facets of that pure, beautiful diamond that is emanating light and love and life. <clears throat> Isn't that amazing as humanity that we can um, attribute uh, these things as love, but they're not reflecting love and, and, and be self-righteous in it and thinking that God is on our side or we're on God's side or whatever it is. And yet we're violating the very thing that actually is his primal nature since he's primally relational. You know, yeah. my sister and I used to kind of have an argument because she was into truth, truth, truth. And, 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 and of course I'm, I'm just can't get off love when I get it, I'll get off of it. But, um, and I, I just felt like, well, yeah, the truth is that he's love and love is, is, is his truth. And they're, they're not adversarial, right? They're different reflections. Uh, and sometimes love absolutely looks like truth because truth sets us free because he, he desires our highest good. He wants his kids free. So what's the truth we need to know in, in experience freedom that he's, that love is already provided for us. And so, yeah, it, yeah so I, I, I love that. I love that. So, um, what would you say, um, why do you think people are so afraid? It's almost like they're afraid that he would be that good right yeah well i suppose you know you used the word primal earlier and so that remind is reminds me of the garden of eden story which i think is a, a the story of humanity it's not just two humans mm -hmm. it is the human condition mm -hmm. in 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 a very uh, powerful narrative where at a primal level um it is inevitable that we'll stumble, we'll turn from love at some point, and they do. And um, and in doing so, it's like we we I'm Adam and Eve, you're Adam and Eve. We we trip and 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 we experience shame, and then out of that shame, we construct a God who we're afraid of. And so so some of it is we've just created a God out of our own shame. It's a projection mm -hmm. rooted in shame a sense of a deep sense of not being okay in ourselves, not belonging, um, a dis-ease of who we are. But then also like, why do we get so afraid that he might be that good? Well, it's almost like we think he's that 
everyone will go off the rails. Right. Not realizing they're already off the rails and it's love who's come to rescue us from a loveless culture, a loveless society, loveless lovelessness and that, that Jesus calls perishing. And yeah. so uh, what is his medicine for those who are perishing? Is it threats of punishment? No, it's it's a invitation to turn turn to the one who's never turned away from us. And I, I think that's like just super important, but we kind of don't trust it. It's a little bit like Romans 6.1, you know, Paul's just been saying that that Christ has forgiven and reconciled us even when we were still enemies mm -hmm. and then he just knows where we're going to go with it so he says what shall we continue to sin that grace may abound and it's like right. no that's not it you guys he's but you can see <laughs> that's the instinct right yeah the instinct yeah. is but if he's this loving then then just like sin just goes rampant and it's like sin's already rampant the problem is that we've not obeyed the first two commandments to love god with our whole hearts mm -hmm. mind soul strength to love our neighbors as ourselves. And if we knew we we're beloved, mm -hmm. if we're under the gaze of a tender, loving father, um, it seems like, wow, we could reflect that into the world. And and that would swallow up a lot of this darkness that we're so afraid of that's already, you know, gone crazy out here. So yeah, love is getting us getting us back on back on the right rails, but back of, on the rails of, of life and uh, what God has for us. I, I, you know, what helps me when I'm trying to, you know, when you're grappling, I don't know if you, you grapple this way, but when I'm grappling with, okay, so is this, um, is this thought or is this action, is that a sinful, and I, and I, I use that in quotations because we're talking about mistaken identity and operating out of that. Um, but is this, is this thing something that's, that is, violating uh, righteousness and holiness. And I, I go back to what helps me, and I don't know if this is really valid, but it helps me. So maybe that's what makes it valid. But unless I'm delusional, you know, does it violate love? Does it violate love? And then what does love look like here? So when we're dealing with the hard issues of the day where it's like, yeah, there's that and there's that and this part looks good, but something's not quite right here. But this, doesn't, you know, it's it can be confusing really fast. Um, and then I'm so I, I go to God and so what does love look like here? And so I'm just meditating on what's at stake, who's involved and, um, and how I handle myself uh, and ask for help handling myself. Cause I, I, I can't do this by myself. We're not supposed to do anything by ourselves. Um, and does it look like love? And then for me, that helps me. It's my, it's a little bit of, it's like a true North uh, because love is not wimpy by any means. Um, and love will be whatever it needs to be for the other's highest good. And so how do we walk that out? I don't know. How does that hit you? It really, really strongly resonates um, for a few reasons. So one is I love the idea, the metaphor of a true North, um, mm -hmm. be, that North star, because what it, what it does is it, it gives you a direction to move instead of a, a another law Mm -hmm. to to confine you mm -hmm. it's it it's it's a direction that we're called to you know and it's dynamic and then the other thing that you really emphasize there that i think is just absolutely important is you're not assuming what love will always look like you're asking what does it look like in this moment because this moment is so complex and the people are so complex mm -hmm. that there's no way i can bring a template of love to it mm -hmm. i mean the what I do have is the image of Jesus Christ. And if you watch him, wow, he, he just knows what love looks like in so many situations. And it's absolutely not a, um, a cookie cutter approach yeah. or an assumption of a particular way of doing the law. Um, and so even a, and a good example of that would be like, when do we need, um, to draw a healthy boundary. You know, someone asked me on Sunday, it's like, mm -hmm. but all this turn your other cheek stuff, it just means you don't have healthy boundaries. I'm like, no, turn the other cheek means you don't retaliate with violence. Mm -hmm. But love calls for healthy boundaries because they're not only good for you, they're good for the other person. And that's how you, 
let's say that's how you love a boundary breaker is to set a boundary and enforce it. But with like, okay, now how do I do that? Well, let's pray about that. <laughs> Lord, what will that look like? And how, what would mercy and kindness and love look like inside of that? I, I love that because with the boundary breaker, you know, the one that tends to violate appropriate, healthy boundaries, um, that is not good for them, right? So who they are is not being elevated, it's being denigrated when they're behaving in a way that's violating. And yeah. so stemming that and saying, no, I'm, you know, I'm sorry you feel that way, but you know, this is, this is how it is. Um, uh, you know, and, and dealing with their pushback because sometimes, uh, loving people, you'll get pushback, you know, but put, but when it's real, what you're able to stand, it gives you a strength because you're seeing something greater than the immediate behavior that you that's in front of you right now. Yeah. That's yeah. really true. You know, you see it in the addictions community too, right? Like, so mm -hmm. what is codependency mm -hmm. is about thinking you're being nice, thinking you're rescuing, thinking, and you're actually enabling the addiction in a way that harms the other person. And mm -hmm. so we need to learn how to be helpers instead of rescuers. And well, what does that mean? And well, but right back into your prayers, Lord, what will it look like in this moment? Do I help this person? How do I help this person? What's going to backfire here? So mm -hmm. I suppose what we're presupposing is that we're in partnership with divine love mm -hmm. and we're in conversation with divine love. Mm -hmm. And at some point, Jesus promise must be true that he's given us a counselor. Yes. And that those who ask for wisdom, receive wisdom, according to James 1, like generously so. So, we, you know, Lord, we need wisdom today in how to love so that we don't throw up our hands and walk away, mm -hmm. so that we don't move into control, mm -hmm. so that we don't, you know, enable harmful behaviors. So, yeah, these are what we're moving now into is that, that love is a person who communicates with us the stuff we need to know. Oh, wow. and, that, and, and empowers us to actually be able to receive it and hear it. You know, when we're, when, because when we can, I, you know, I find like when I'm listening to God, when the hardest time to hear and connect is when I'm full of fear, full of anger, full of offense, um, all of that. And that's the hardest time or, or, or emotionally like shut down. If I'm, you know, um, but when I'm able to rest and relax and trust, it opens things up so I, I can actually hear the wisdom. And I think that's why it's so helpful how we help one another when we're having a hard time hearing uh, is to come alongside. And that puts people in a position where they're empowered so they can get the wisdom that they do need. Because sometimes like, it's really confusing, like, wow, uh, you know, God is the only one that's going to navigate us out of situate none of us is smart enough with our own brilliance or whatever or our own techniques or our own training um it's it's an it's a live interaction that we navigate through and god is able he's i mean he's he's masterful at helping us navigate through all these rocky things and bring us out on the other side and creating a win-win and that's it's really breathtaking yeah that, that that's a good metaphor isn't it like love is our navigator or we could say that the holy spirit is it navigates us toward love or however you want to do that the, again so the, the language of navigation is around i feel lost i'm confused i'm not sure what to do i'm afraid i'm angry whatever well first order of business is then hook up with the navigator like engage there and even if it means like i've got to rage at him, I, I have to rage a little bit first yeah but well, rage in his presence and, and, and don't leave before you're done because having got it off your chest, those, those angry Psalms, for example, once you've done that, you're not done. That's when you start the listening. That's when you're ready to hear something. It's like, okay, I've said what I need to say. Yeah. Now I'm ready to hear what I need to hear. Now that, that can take some time mm -hmm. and it can take company too, like to have mm -hmm. uh, empathetic witnesses who walk with us in it. That's a wonderful gift. I think it's very, it's a Christ-like gift to have that. Yeah, it, it so is. And we're just not intended to do this journey alone, you know, and I love what you said, because if we need to rage and sometimes we need to rage a lot, there's a lot of things that are rage worthy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when, you know, what's amazing when you're raging in the presence of God, number one, he's not surprised. <laughs> he's not offended. 
he knew was there anyway. And it's actually a relational thing. This is where I'm at. This is like all I can see in my screen right now. And I need to get it out before you with you so I can get past it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's a beautiful thing that God's, God's not all offended. Like even when you're raging against him, why did you let this horrible thing happen? Or why didn't you do something or whatever? All the fingers we tend to point at God uh, when tragedy happens or whatever, or disappointment happens and we can just go to him and <laughs> rage, rage at him with him. And I, I love the way he just, he just, he, he takes it because it matters and he cares, but he's not moved by it. It's not like it overwhelms him or it shorts him out or something, or he was so disappointed because, you know, you just don't look like a good little Christian right now. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, 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 so that answers a question that I think a lot of folks would have. And that is if I let myself express this rage, is that bad? Well, I think if we express our rage outside of, a conscious awareness that God is with us. So I'm raging at the television or I'm raging at a, with a friend who is just sympathetic to my rage. It can actually feed the anger. Mm -hmm. sure. But when you, when you bring that rage into um, a loving presence, mm -hmm. the presence of God, and again, with an empathetic witness and they, they hear you and they're not, they're not stoking your their, your rage it's it's like you're expunging it it's it you you really do release it if you do it that way whereas others can you could do the very same practice and it actually energizes the anger and hatred stoking. and malice yeah stoking so it. that's i think the practice of the presence of god is is really important to this kind of process yeah. And I love, I love that word practice because who does this perfectly or, or, you know, all the time, none of us, and, but we get to practice. And so that, that gives us permission not to do it well. Yeah. Well, I need <laughs> until that. We do better. <laughs> yeah. Until we do it better. Um, but it takes a lot of pressure off. You know, I, I, one of the things that I've, as I've been encountering God as this person of love, he is, he's so, um, he's so relaxed and conscientious. Like he, he cares. He wants to hear it. If it's on your heart, it matters to him. So I can start to relax and maybe not be so overwhelmed by whatever is feeling like it's overwhelming me yeah. um, because he's kind of the a repository. If it's toxic, you know, he wants it. It's like, yeah, that that's what I want. That toxic. Yeah. That's what I want. Um, and I, you know, it's interesting. I was, I was talking to someone and she was just, afraid that she'd like overwhelm God with her burdens. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> poor, poor God. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, I, I think this combination is important that you've described. So, so on the one hand, he's absolutely infinitely attentive. Like he's, he has, you have all of God's attention. And at the same time, completely unrattled. Like yeah. we bring our worst mm -hmm. and um, the early church, they used to talk about this. They called it, it was a doctrine of called impassibility mm -hmm. and impassibility. What it, what was intended is that God is not overwhelmed um, by anything you bring to him. It's not going to rattle to him or set him off. He's not going to into a reactive rage. Um, he can be still and hear these confessions and he can be completely at peace in himself in your crises and that he doesn't he doesn't um have a panic attack along with you he's able to minister from a bottomless well of resources toward you unfortunately some folks um took that impassable and they took it as well as if he doesn't care or he's the unmoved mover it's like mm -hmm. oh no he's he cares and he's utterly responsive, but he's just simply doesn't have a meltdown. When I have a meltdown, he needs to, he wants me to know that he's a stable place to come stable, but understanding. And, and so Hebrews two Hebrews four, it says we absolutely have a empathetic high priest. He's been through what we've been through. He knows and he cares and he gets it. And He's living on the other side of that now is Victor and who wants to share that victory with us. 
That's so great. When you talk about the impassibility, are you talking about like one of the tulip things in Calvinism? Is that what you're referring to with this impassibility or did I mistake that as an no. early church doctrine? Yeah, no, this is an earlier, early church thing. First three, four centuries, they talked about it. Yeah. Um, uh, um, Calvin had a different way. Calvinism has a different way of dealing with it. <laughs> and that is God just decides everything up front, who to condemn, who to bless and and so there's he just elects some to salvation and some to damnation and um it feels very cold-hearted to me impassibility though wasn't it was the god who moves towards us without being um let's say tainted by our mess it's he's just yeah he's just so kind that way and his so his kindness and his mercy are are everlasting they're unfailing he's completely faithful if you can boil it all down to this way is he doesn't ever turn from us he doesn't ever withdraw from us if that were our doctrine of so that i think this is the idea is impassibility is an attribute that we'll only understand as a facet of love mm -hmm. if you try to make it its own little thing then it turns into something really weird and cold and right. like like granite or something god god's this uh granite wall and right. he's not moved that's not what we mean we just mean that he's in a real relationship with us where he's not about to walk away which is so amazing this is what we need when we're overwhelmed and you know all of that we need someone who's who's bigger than us who infinitely cares but is not freaking out about what we're freaking out yeah that's it that's exactly it you know, it's like if, if we're the two-year-old having a tantrum, we need a parent who's like, honey, when you're ready to be done with that, we can we can move forward, right? It's not overwhelmed, but does care and keeps yeah. us safe in the meantime. But while we're having our meltdown, um, you know, the infinitely good parent that helps guide us through the thorny things that we're that we're feeling with. Yeah. Yeah. So that's and I love that. Just another love the way that just dovetails right in another facet of love his impassibility is this um, mastery and this this ability to answer to be an answer and and not moved by the extremity of the situation but touched by the feelings of our infirmities at this oh time. that's exactly it you've really got the texture of it um there's a visual version of this too if people people can have a look uh if they google like orthodox icon jesus what you're going to find there is he's never smiling and that bothers us sometimes because we believe that jesus was full of joy mm -hmm. that he's the most joyful person in the universe and yet when we see these icons he looks quite serious and then some iconographers didn't understand god's heart and they actually make him look quite angry or grumpy or judgy mm -hmm. they've completely missed it but a really good icon of jesus is there in the church so that somebody who has come in from a let's say a sexual assault can come before him and he's not just grinning back at them he's saying and he's not angry he's just saying i know and i care mm -hmm. and 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 that's that's a person we can trust when we've let's say somebody in the ravages of war right now and they've lost a loved one in the ukrainian war or or let's say their their loved one's been taken away in the night in you know in the west bank or something and and you're like we come to them with all our cares so you have to think about the greatest burden you've ever borne in your whole life who is the jesus i need to meet in that moment um, he won't be the happy clappy one, but he also won't be the reactive nervous one, but he also won't be the angry, you know, like raging one. He's going to be the, I know, and I care. And like, look at me, it's, we're going to make it. So that's, what's going on with that. And it's a good visual of it. I think that's, yes, that's so good. I know I care. Um, and I also know how to bring you through. There's something on the other side of this that, that I know, and that you may not know yet, but I know. And yeah me in that he's the, so we could really think about the lamb image too right because so in revelation we see the lamb who's standing as if slain and so what we know here is this the god we come to has been crucified and has risen is mm -hmm. not has been 
I apologize. I take that back. It's he, he is risen. He, and, and we would even say he is crucified. Yes. He experiences our torment. Um, but he's experienced it as the risen one who's able to absorb that in infinite love and recycle it as grace and mercy. Wow. And then, yeah, boy, that's beautiful. That's, and it's so powerful because, you know, the more, the more you look around at, you know, how messed up things are, or just even in your own, maybe in your own life or just someone around you, it can get overwhelming really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. As we're looking at that, and um, and and those are real things. These are those are real real experiences. And so to have a God who's not, I don't know, fake or plastic or you know, is not that what is it that that uh, uh, salt in a wound or vinegar? There's something about vinegar. I don't. I'm trying to remember the scripture. But when when someone is grieving and that you're like inappropriately, this is not the time. You know, Hallelujah. You know, where this is not the time. There, there will be a time, but that time we do weep with those who weep, but yes. we also hold the tension that joy comes in the morning. Yeah. And so, um, and being that for one another and him being that for us is, uh, it, 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 it creates that hope that, wow, there's something past this and I won't be stuck in the abyss of my pain or my fear or my anxiety or whatever is going on. There's something past it that transcends it. And I get to be taken into that with him which is uh amazing so yeah let for like yeah that's a good place to maybe think about then like the phrase you used was we we get to be that for others then right and so maybe this is what um uh what jesus means by take up your cross and follow me he's not just saying well i have to go die and you're gonna have to go die and or you know, I had a hard life and you're going to have a hard life. It's, it's no, like the, the cross is about the self-giving, radically forgiving, co-suffering love of God. The cross in that sense is not the crucifixion. It's what God does in the crucifixion. And what God does is, is he, he gives himself to the other. He, he shows this radical forgiveness to the other, the sinner. He, he co-suffers with those and weeps with those who are in pain and it's like maybe if that's what the cross means then that's what it means for us to take it up and be that for the other yeah. so i think i think we could so we'll often talk about this as cruciform love cruciform is a fancy word for cross-shaped so if god is cruciform love we can be cruciform love for the other if if we're willing to um love when it's painful to love and to extend grace when it would be easier to, you know, walk away. If we can show forgiveness, um, even to those who actually offended us <laughs> and like, um, and, and then this idea of being a, a person who walks in empathy with wounded limping people, mm -hmm. maybe that's what take up your cross and follow me and tell Wow, that's beautiful. It reminds me of in that context, you know, when when Christ in John 16 said, um, a new commandment I give you that you want to love one another as I have loved you. Mm -hmm. So this is our kind of the commandment that we're under, that everything else, you know, is fulfilled in that that I don't know, way of being or um and so it reminds me of that and in, in loving one another, another and being that for one another. And then also there are times when we, we need that, you know, it's, it's like, it's that time where like, I, I'm that I'm, I'm that for someone else, but then there are times when we need to, in our humility with the things that we're struggling, you know, be able to receive that for ourselves because we all, you know, we all have times when we, we struggle and it's, it's regardless of how what the ministries look like or how brilliant we are or that kind of thing. It's part of being human and learning that interdependency um, that we're able to receive that as well as give that at appropriate times. 
Um, and I think it's, you know, I think I, the hardest people that I find to minister to a lot of times are ministers because it's like, okay, so let's put the ministry mode down. This is your receiving time, you know, and yeah. I, and I have to kind of switch a button for me when I'm like, oh, okay, wait, 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 okay, let me, okay, let me, <laughs> this is receiving time. What a concept. I mean, sometimes that's, that's hard to do, particularly when we're having a hard time putting down our masks and just being vulnerable, you know, with whatever we're going through as, as, as ministers or theologians, all of that, um, you know, because we're loving as we love ourselves. And so there's a time in that there's a receiving time as well. And not just from God, but from one another, from the appropriate people that God sends to you to be that. And it's kind of, it's yeah. an interesting shift. It's like a, an automatic gear shift. Like, okay, wait, I'm out of that. And now we're doing this now. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that's good. That's a good skill and, and an important shift. In, in fact, it's like, I'm really nervous about Christian leaders who don't walk with a spiritual limp. I don't think I can trust them. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that they've done something bad, but like, if they can't be vulnerable enough to receive, then like, where did they, how did they come to a place where they can give? And so I was very, I'm going to, I'm going to use the word lucky on purpose because, you know, <laughs> God made me lucky as a young youth pastor, where one of the first things that happened um, was I went in and I had no skills in this. I was a biblical studies major, but I got thrown into a youth role and there was like these empty shelves. I go into this new office and on the, they weren't quite empty. There was a couple books. There was a little one about youth ministry. And I, I, I probably only read the first page, but on the first page, it said, don't, don't reach youth, train youth to reach youth. Oh, and wow. so I thought I, you know, other people have these big youth groups. I was starting with six kids. I thought this is a lame youth group, but it would be a pretty kick-ass uh, ministry team if I train them uh -huh. and I'm going to train them to pray for people. And I'm going to train them to pray for people by having them pray for me. And I, and you know, for the next 10 years, <laughs> um, the youth group would surround me and pray for me at least usually once or twice a week. So I could go into that receive mode. And just by my experience of that, it was, it bore good fruit and it was really lovely and it's zero threat. It's just like, what's the big deal? But I see guys come into conferences who have mega churches and expensive suits and good hair. And I'm like, wow, they, they have it together, but they can't turn it off. And I, I don't, I would love to, it takes days to help them turn it off. And when they do, you, you actually find out, oh, there is a vulnerable little kid yeah. in there who needs help and love, but wow, layers and layers of Tin Man armor. And um, so that's that's something we really need to be mindful of oh. um i wish i had it all together i i would have probably been done less damage but i think mm, thinking i thinking i did have it all together that would have made me 10 times more toxic uh, so toxic and i mean and and then you know you and in ministry, we see the the fallout and the ministries that go uh, sideways and in really spectacular ways and the swath of damage that that causes. And, you know, you're, you're thinking that that leader or that group of leaders had stuff that needed to be dealt with. Um, and, you know, and, and so we have to be uh, uh, vulnerable, but also humble and realize that impacting other people's lives that that requires a level of authenticity and a willingness to realize that we're just human beings like everyone else um uh that actually makes us safe you know not not that you share all your stuff with everybody no it's just whoever god assigns but there needs to be someone and um that, that means that we need to be safe places for other people um, for other for other leaders where they're actually given permission to actually have a problem um, that they need someone to come alongside in an earth suit, not just one on one with Jesus, but in an earth suit with Jesus um, with them. And that makes them safe. And, and love looks like, yeah, you get to partake and you get to, you know, uh, give out. And so 
Um, and it's this beautiful dance and it's such freedom. And you see the level of, you know, when it's just about anointing or, um, you know, the number of miracles you can pull off or how brilliant you are um, and wh whatever, how many people you got saved and all the different check marks or how well am I doing? Um, I think that's incredibly dangerous. Um, those things are fruit and that's great fruit. But if if it's about love, that means we need to receive love. We need to receive whatever it is that we're needing um, and deal with the crap that we carry uh, that makes us actually genuinely safe, authentic people while we still walk with limbs. Because, you know, when I arrive, I'll come find everybody, but don't hold your breath anytime soon. But we're we're journeying and we're we're doing better and and we're better for one another which i think is amazing so we have to, and i think that's one of the benefits of community i think that one of the things that we really that really messes up is is when we isolate um and uh, i think covid did a number on a lot of us for that but it also gave us new community you know i don't know if i would have connected with you Right. Or not for Zoom. You know, that was like the thing that sort of blossomed during that period of time. So God always opens something in that. But uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's amazing. And that's part of being love for one another in in ministry, but love for one another. You know, just everything's min it's all ministry. Cooking dinner is ministry. It's all ministry. But, you know, yep. for leaders who think that somehow that's weak or or just can't turn it off. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay, so the thing to not turn off would be love. <laughs> Giving, receiving, and sharing and connecting, exchanges of grace in little ways and and uh that don't even need to become big ways, but maybe some do and and uh but it's yeah, I I suppose also then um uh there's room to say something about like how uh, where the ego fits in this so mm -hmm. sometimes ego ego gets a bad rap because we think of because i think of egoism and i'll go there in a moment but you know we all have an eye we all relate to the other mm -hmm. and how i relate to the other i do with from uh and and differentiate from you and communicate with you is there's an eye and there's a thou and so maybe there's in that sense we have ego and that people who've been dehumanized they need more ego strength i don't need to go shatter their ego the problem is actually egoism and that's when the ego crawls up on the throne and the ego displaces uh jesus instead of serving him and and the ego then as christianity buddhism sufi islam hinduism i mean they actually they all ran into this at some point in their wisdom literature and that if we can see God as our beloved and see ourselves as beloved by God and th that we're in union with God, then the only thing that can get in the way is, is ego. Wow. Like even persecution can't do it. And, and, uh, and even the, even ego, does it really get in the way of God? Well, it gets in my way of my awareness. The union is there. The living connection is there. What I need Christ to do for me, he's done for me. Who I need God to be for me, he is for me. And he's not He's not left. He's with me. He's in me. He's in you. He's in us. Um, so maybe egoism is a kind of just, it's a barrier to my attention. It's a barrier to my awareness. It's kind of being asleep to to the truth that is. And so isn't it nice, though, that we don't have to perform in order to get that union with god that's already the done deal but if there's somehow we can wake up and um and pay attention to the goodness that is i think i think uh for people to understand how how god has has united himself to them indivisibly forever oh how much easier would our walk be Oh, it's so much relief because it's ba if it's based on my or your ability to maintain it, do good deeds, do, I don't know, be perfected, whatever the qualifications are, we're, you know, we're in deep doo-doo. It's just not, it's, you know, that's a very insecure and, and we know it. I mean, this is why when there's such um, 
hoops we need to jump through, whatever. It's such torment because we know we can't. We know we're yeah. going to fail. So we live in a very insecure place. Mm. Uh, we're only as good as our last good thing that we did that we know we're going to screw up in the next five minutes. And so there's a very insecure pace. And that that's where that beauty is, that 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 perfect love casts out fear because love has already chosen us and united based on his choice. And yeah. then we get to choose back as we wake up. And, you know, this is kind of what this as I'm kind of seeing this is a lot of what this conversation is about. It's just help, helping people wake up again, We're stirring Holy Spirit, stirring inside with something that like, okay, wait, oh yes, that's a thing. That's, you know, our, our hearts start to resonate with what God is doing as we're really talking about him and, you know, who he is and these facets and what that is and what that means, where the rubber meets the road where we live. And which is why it's so fun and so refreshing because, you know, God is so in it. He just, I am kind of enjoying his enjoyment right now of the conversation because it's, a, it's, it's so life-giving and he's in it. He's so present. I'm really hoping that those that listen to this are like, maybe they need to sh shut their eyes and allow that to rise up within them, that presence, that, that him with them and just enjoying people where they're at. And you know, the fact that you showed up is amazing. The fact that you're listening is amazing. The fact that you're a turning, turning your uh, affection and attention towards him. It's like, well, I was here the whole time, but I'm so glad you, you know, you're, you're turning that affection towards me. And there are times during the day, I mean, I minister a lot and do all sorts of good things and none of it's bad or whatever. Well, not, I'll never, I never do anything bad, but whatever. And, mm -hmm. and there'll be times I'm at the end of my day and I'm like, God, I haven't talked to you for, for myself all day long. I am so sorry. And you know, you know, the thing he always says, he's like, I'm just so glad you thought you, you remembered me now, whatever, you know, cause I've been with you the whole day. He's easy to please, which is amazing. It's not like how you did not carry and give me your first hour. No, I woke up and it was like, you know, crazy, good, but crazy. And, you know, I'm like, oh, hi, Jesus, you're there. Um, and that's a very uh, reassuring thing that you, you're never going to run into part of his mercy, just part of his, he's, he's pre-pleased, not, not with everything we do, but whenever we turn our affection towards him, it's not like, well, where were you? I've been waiting all day long, you know? <laughs> yeah 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 no shame no shame right. just invitation yeah. yeah yeah that's so that's so beautiful wow well that's i love that i love that oh goodness i've been talking way too much brad at what not at all <laughs> <laughs> it's been it's really fun so what else are you getting are you tracking with anything else did it stir anything else up for you um no, I should probably, I should probably almost sign off now. Uh, that was such a good ending. I, I don't want to wreck what you've just laid out there as a, <laughs> you know, we can talk again, but what a, what a beautiful epilogue that you provided in the summary. So well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Well, it, it blessed me. It's been so much fun having you. I can't believe this time is whizzed by so fast, but I know you've got things, you got packing and things to do. So um yeah so thank you for making time it's it's always a joy it is always my pleasure a yeah wonderful all right everybody well thank you for watching and let us know how this impacted you make sure you share it someone's going to need this and thank you for watching and thank you once again brad thanks for having me all right well everybody have a great great evening day whatever time it is bye-bye <laughs>